Hey everyone, uh, welcome to the Leadership Summit or Leadership Session on Networking. Uh, it's great to be here, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Dave Brown, uh, I lead the EC2 Compute and Networking teams, uh, based in Seattle now. I started out at, uh, with Amazon uh, 12 years ago in the Cape Town office um, with the early EC2 team. Um, and so some of you I see wearing those t-shirts that say is it AMI or is it AMI? I want to let you know from the early EC2 team it's absolutely AMI. Uh, so you may have bought the wrong T-shirt. I, I paid more for my one. Um, some of you may have missed that joke, but uh, anyway, let's let's get into it. And so it's it's really good to be here to talk about networking. Um, we always start off with a slide, the broadest customer base for networking. Some of you might see your logos there. Um, you know, the thing we just had the privilege of working with customers from startups um, to large enterprises, public sector, uh, solution innovators, and ISVs, system integrators. Uh, and it's just this breadth of customer base, right? In the networking space, many customers coming on board and creating very small VPCs. Some of them start to grow. Some of them are coming in as enterprises and just creating massive VPCs and wanting to do networks, you know, enterprise network scale. I'm on now, thank you. Um, and so great to have all these customers and, and really the breadth of these customers is something that really challenges us and we really enjoy and getting feedback from them. Um, for the ninth consecutive year now, um, we are well, gotten the Magic Quadrant Cloud Leader. Um, this is actually one of the longest running Magic Quadrants that Gartner's had, um, and we've been the leader for those nine years. And so, uh, very good to be in that spot, continue to innovate. Um, what we're gonna be talking about today is a cloud scale network for every workload. And that's kind of how we think about um, you know, the process of iterating uh, within EC2 and at AWS. is constantly saying, let's put something out there, let's build something, and then let's iterate on that um, and see what customers need, right? When we started back in 2006, the network that we had, and some of you might still use that, hopefully, well, hopefully not, the classic network, um, EC2 classic network. By the way, when you see us call something classic, you probably want to find something else to go and use, right? It's just a, it's, it's an indication that we'll keep, obviously keep supporting it, but it, there's, there's always typically something better. Um, and so the classic network is just a flat subnet that everybody launched into, and in 2009 we built VPC, and we're just continually iterating um, on supporting different workloads. And so we've got a lot of, a lot of exciting stuff to talk about today. Um, and so we're gonna get into the talk pretty quickly, um, deal with the global scale and highest availability and what that means from a, a cloud scale network point of view. Um, world class performance, obviously that's super important that we continue to have a level of performance that supports your application, where ideally you don't have to think about the network. Industry leading security, obviously security is always our highest priority, and so making sure that we're on top of security all the time for you. And then building global networks, super excited to talk about that uh, today, and then bringing the cloud closer to you and some of the stuff we're doing there. So let's, get, let's jump straight in. So we're starting off with global scale and the highest availability. And so here's an updated slide of our uh, backbone. Uh, you know, we, we, networking, uh, foot, footprint and reliability matter, right? So the scale of your network, whether you, you span the globe, having the broadest footbook, footprint, uh, networking services around the world, um, that's what we have today. And so today we have uh, 22 regions and 69 availability zones. Um, we have 210 CloudFront uh, locations, and so those are uh, CDN locations. Um, we, you know, we're using CloudFront, you can actually get access to cached content at those locations. That number's actually doubled in the last two years, and so we went from 100 to 210, and the scale we're growing at there. And then obviously 97 uh, Direct Connect locations as well, and so if we, if we zoom in a little bit on that network, everything you see there is a redundant 100 gigabit uh, Ethernet fiber, uh, multiple spans, obviously spanning the globe, um, and it's all private network capacity that's either owned um, or leased by AWS, but all controlled by us. Uh, and so one of the questions is, well, why do we have a backbone? Why does that matter for customers? Uh, the first thing is security is obviously one of the big reasons. Um, we want our customers' traffic to be uh, flowing between regions on a backbone that AWS owns. We don't want to be trusting that uh, traffic on, on another provider or an ISP. Um, second one's availability. We have to do an enormous amount to make sure that the backbone is actually has enough capacity to carry your workload. And if we're just trusting that to ISPs out on the internet, there's a good chance that one of them may not be able to handle the scale if our, multiple of our customers spike at the same time. Um, the other thing is we're able to control any problems with availability. So if we have a broken piece of fiber somewhere, we're able to quickly route around that, and our system's all automated to do that. And so um, the third one is, is performance, and making sure that we have uh, the very best network performance in terms of throughput, the lowest possible packet loss for your workloads, um, and just make sure that you know, you, you're getting the best network uh, between regions or wherever your application needs it. Um, and finally, in a world where more and more applications are going global, 
Uh, you know, many people are building applications today, hosting them in a single AWS region, but your user base is really global. You've got users using your application in every part of the globe. Um, and so we've got to make sure that our backbone spans to all those locations, because you don't want them coming in over local ISPs or you know, mid-mile mid, mid ISPs. You want to get that all into the AWS backbone. And so to be able to say that all region-to-region region traffic traverses the backbone, uh, with the exception of our China region, uh, is kind of a great place to be. We spoke about CloudFront Pops doubling in the last year. This is kind of incredible. If you think about the scale of our backbone, what you just saw, we doubled the backbone capacity in the last year. And if you think about the base that we're growing off there, doubling that capacity in the last year is pretty insane. Um, and so, you know, both just being able to do that to support your workloads and also just honestly being able to do that and actually scale at that pace um, is, is really incredible. There's a, there's a statement that uh, Werner uh, has said before. It's somewhat terrifying. Uh, everything fails all the time. Um, he doesn't mean that everything fails all the time. What he means is, um, as engineers and as developers, we should, we should assume that everything's going to fail all the time and make sure that we have a plan for if any part of our system is going to fail, how is our system going to respond? How are we going to degrade? How do we make sure we mitigate impact? And so that's how we think about things. Now, in the case of networking, when you have a network at our scale, um, you're going to see things like this pretty much on a daily basis. We have enough pieces of fiber. So this is actually in our US East uh, one region. Uh, this was a construction crew that were doing some work on the side of the road. And uh, they had a backhoe, and they dug a hole, and they broke our fiber. And as you can see, we we're actually letting out quite a bit of light on that piece of fiber. And so it's not going to be transmitting any packets at all. Uh, what happened with this one is within a few, uh, obviously, uh, initially, we, we failed away from this. This was actually one of our uh, regions we've recently deployed over the last year or so. We've been deploying optical failover. So it doesn't rely on, rely on route reconvergence. And so optical level failover for this event, we actually dropped 13 packets and failed over to another, another piece of fiber. And then what happens is we had a piece of dark fiber available that we were able to light up um, within, a, within about an hour or so and bring that on as redundant capacity. And then this is a lot of damage to a piece of fiber. And so it, it took a couple of days um, to get that fixed before we will be able to bring it back on board. But some of the things we do, if you think about all this fiber out there, um, both within our regions, so between our data centers, and then obviously uh, within the metro regions as well, um, you know, what do we do to make sure that we can deal with things like that? And so the first one is we have a lot of dark fiber spans. Um, so basically these are optimized for low latency and physical diversity. So a lot of spans. Physical diversity means we want to make sure that these pieces of fiber don't follow the same path. I want to make sure I never have a situation where that backhoe goes through two pieces of fiber at the same time. Um, that's all Amazon controlled. That's one of the requirements. We make sure we never use a piece of fiber that's not under our control. Um, and then location tracking. This is something we've been doing in the last few years, is we actually have geospatial information for every piece of fiber um, in our, in our, that we're using globally. Um, and we get that from the providers. And what we do with that information is we collect that. We have some machine learning that we run against that um, to make sure that we don't have any two pieces of fiber that are close enough to be affected at the same point in time. The other thing we do is we run, we run models to understand if any fiber in our network fails, what is the impact that that'll have? Would it actually cause a customer event? Even though we lose a single piece of fiber, is there a routing misconfiguration somewhere that it actually caused packet loss or cause a problem for customers? And so we can identify that before it actually happens. And then we use uh, multiplexing as well, um, basically able to put multiple uh, uh, light waves through a single piece of fiber and just give us more capacity. Um, one of the other things we've really done, uh, we've taken a different approach on to other cloud providers, is the strong regional isolation uh, of, our, of, our day, of our regions. And so we took a very strong stance back in 2008 when we launched the second region for EC2. We said at no point in time would we ever share data between any of our regions. Um, and so that's why when you use AWS today, you talk to different endpoints when you use the service. And there was a lesson we learned back in 2008, and that changed our view. We said there's no way we can guarantee availability if we don't have strong isolation between regions. We'll, we'll be in a situation where multiple regions fail at the same time. And we've gone as far as actually we have the networking team at AWS has a script or a monitor that runs. And if we catch any team sharing data between regions, they'll actually get a high severity ticket saying that we found something and you need to go and sort it out because it could be a problem. And that's one of the biggest reasons, I think, if you look at the last year, why if you look at the next largest cloud provider, they've had seven times more downtime than we've had in, with, with AWS. And a large part of that has been this regional isolation. Um, and this, the strong view that we have um, on, on that isolation has prevented us from having events that affect multiple regions at the same time. Um, it's also actually affected the Gartner Magic Quadrant. And so while we've stayed in the same place, some others have moved around. 
um, based on the availability record in the last year. And so uh, it goes back to that other thing we say, there's no compression algorithm for experience. And uh, you know, being able to run what we've done for the period of time and just how much focus we have in learning lessons um, has allowed us to be able to achieve that level of availability. And we obviously can never, ever, ever drop our guard. And so we've got to remain vigilant at all times. So, it's super important. Let's dive in uh, world-class performance. I want to start here by talking about uh, something we launched about two years ago, uh, 2017 reInvent, we launched our first Nitro instance. And you know, most of you probably know what Nitro is. Uh, for those of you that, that don't, um, Nitro is, is uh, a new hypervisor, a new uh, way of running uh, virtualization in the cloud that we developed or have developed over the last four to five years. And so we started in 2012, and we said, could we offload networking to an offload card? Um, and, and the reason we did that was when you run networking as part of the Zen hypervisor, um, you see a lot of jitter. You're not able to get the sort of consistent performance that you would really like for tail latencies. And so by offloading to a hardware uh, card, um, we were able to significantly improve our, our throughput and our, and our latencies and, and reduce our jitter significantly. And so Nitro is all about hardware cards that go into a server. We have a Nitro security chip that runs on the motherboard and controls a whole lot of things um, and makes sure that that server is completely secure, including things like um, attestation of the server at boot to make sure that nothing's changed in that server that we don't expect to have changed, um, and also has a Nitro hypervisor as well. Um, and so back in 2013, uh, we started working with a company called Annapurna Labs. Um, it's an Israeli-based chip manufacturer, um, and we really enjoyed working with them. They were a smart bunch, uh, and they, were, they kind of thought about things the way that we did. And so we iterated a lot, we launched a couple of instances with them, and then we decided we liked them so much, we actually bought them in 2014. And so they're part of AWS today. Um, we still call them Annapurna Labs internally. Um, and so what we do with them is, is they literally make and manufacture uh, processes and chips uh, and network cards for us, these, these hardware offloading devices. And so if you saw Graviton 2, that was done by Annapurna Labs, Graviton 1 as well. Um, and then what, what we do is that every about 18 months or so, they bring out a new network card. And so we get a new card from them, and there's a whole lot of new functionality. Um, the software engineering teams work together with them to put a lot of functionality into that processor. They design the processor, and then you know, every 18 months or so, a new one comes out. And so if you look at our C5, which is our high-performance uh, compute instance type, and then we launched a thing called the C5N, the C5 has the third generation Annapurna network card in it, and the C5N has the fourth generation Annapurna network card in it. And you can see the difference there. The C5 offers you 25 gigabits of throughput. Uh, it's, it's, it's good for most. Uh, but if you really want to get that throughput and that low latency and that high packet per second, you've got the C5N, which will give you 100 gigabits of throughput. We announced that last year at reInvent, and we're still the only cloud provider to have 100 gigabit of Ethernet capacity uh, in the cloud today. And so very proud of that. Um, and so how good is it? How big was the change between the two, the two cards, the two Nitro or Flow cards? And so here are some benchmarks that we ran. Um, the first graph is showing you throughput. And so obviously, as we said, 25 gigabits, we were able to sustain that. On the 100 gigabit, we were able to stay, uh, sustain around 90, 91 gigabits of throughput. On the latency, obviously lower on that graph is better, by the way. Uh, and so 68 uh, microseconds for the C5 versus 27 microseconds uh, on the C5N, on the new card. So significant drop in latency there. And then packets per second. This is super important. If you're, running, if you're a partner that develops network appliances, I'm sure you've probably bumped into packet per second at some point where you don't have enough of them. And we've been working really hard to make sure that we have a lot of packets per second. And so 1.93 on the C5, and we're up to 5.05 on the C5N. And that number's going a lot higher. We continue to work in that area and optimize. Um, actually, a press release that came out uh, on Monday. And uh, this one caught my eye, and I added it to my keynote. I was like, this is fantastic. Uh, this is one of my favorite sports, uh, Formula One. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is a form of motor racing where you turn both left and right. Um, and <laughs> and, and what, uh, what, what they've been struggling with, if any of you have watched Formula One, and you go back to you know, the, maybe the, the, the 90s or the early 2000s, um, it was a very exciting sport. You had wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing um, and you know, a lot of overtaking. It was a fun to watch. Um, Formula One's gotten a little sleepy lately, and, and the reason for that is they've gotten so good with the downforce and the aerodynamics on the cars that when one car is following another car, they don't have enough downforce, and so they just start to fall behind. So you can never ever get to a point where one car can catch up and actually have a good wheel-to-wheel -wheel race or overtaking maneuver. And so uh, a lot of fans are kind of getting a little jaded about Formula One, and Formula One have been working with us. They've been a fantastic uh, customer to work with, super exciting. And what they did is they took our C5N clusters and they actually ran a computational fluid dynamic workload. And what they were trying to do is design the Formula One car for 2021. And they wanted to solve this problem of, can I have a car that has a lot of downforce, 
but doesn't disturb the air behind me and actually cause the other car to not have the downforce. And so I can get back to the wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing that they have. And so they've actually just finished that. They've designed the 2021 car with that process. They used uh, 1,150 compute cores of our C5Ns. Obviously, the 100-gig networking was a big part in that. Um, and they were able to do the simulation with an average runtime a reduction of 70%. So they went from 60 hours of running that simulation to just 18. And so hopefully 2021 should be a really exciting season uh, if you're into Formula One. Um, that's obviously in the HPC space, and we actually recently just won a number of awards uh, in the HPC space provided by the HPC Wire magazine. Um, this just happened a few weeks ago. And this is our innovation in, in both compute, but also in the 100 gig networking. 100 gigs of networking on these machines has completely changed the way a lot of companies are thinking about HPC and the way that they're thinking about machine learning. We've seen very, very large machine learning clusters because there's enough network bandwidth now to actually you know, transfer the necessary data between, between the various nodes. And so I suppose the one more question, well, how are we doing, if we, you know, from a Nitro point of view, how are we doing uh, against the other large cloud providers? And so there was an uh, external research company called Enterprise Strategy Group that actually conducted a survey of this, and they ran, they ran a simulation over about six months. This is just using standard EC2, not doing anything uh, fancy uh, you know, to kind of get better performances, and they did the same test across all the cloud providers. They don't actually name, uh, we know which one was us, we don't know which one was the others. And so network performance across the leading cloud providers, you can see throughput um, came in at 30 on vendor X and 28 on vendor Y versus the 90 that we were getting on our C5N. Uh, latency, you can see 34, 43, and 27. And then packet per second, the big difference here, you can see 1, 1.02, 0.52, and then the 5.05 um, that we had measured earlier. And so we're not done. This is a space that we continue to iterate in. I have teams working on this all the time. We're never going to get relaxed, and so it's, it's great to have a lead. We want to keep giving you the very best and the very, you know, the, great, the best throughput, best latency, and the packets per second, super important as well. And so that's talking about performance. Um, let's, let's take a look at uh, some of the security things. You know, many, many years ago, uh, we would have the conversation with customers about, hey, is the cloud secure? You remember there was that, that stage where people worried about security in the cloud? Um, very, very seldom meet anybody worried about that anymore. There's already a perception nowadays that the cloud is actually more secure um, than you could do on-prem. And so you can see the quote from Vodafone there, um, where they're saying from a PCI DSS point of view, they believe they were better off being within AWS than they would have been in one of their own data centers or a co-location facility. Um, and so while we have a, a strong list of you know, security tools, some of them are listed at the top there, obviously compliance, certifications, um, all those sorts of things, um, we've got to make sure that we always protect customer data um, using encryption. And so... Well, we took a, uh, you know, we've said that where physical infrastructure leaves the Amazon, uh, any of our data centers, any of our own properties, any shared properties, basically any, anywhere that, that it's, it's not in a controlled environment, we will encrypt that data. And so today, all traffic between regions is encrypted. That's not true for all cloud providers, by the way. Um, it was something that we very, very strict around in making sure that traffic between regions is, is encrypted. All traffic between data centers within availability zones is encrypted. And all traffic between your C5N, any instance that has an N, is encrypted if you do uh, traffic between those instances. And so if you move to N instances, that new version of the Nitro card offers you line rate encryption just by default that you don't know about. One of the things that customers want to do, uh, we've run into a number of times, is they want to do anomaly detection. So they say, I'm, uh, I need a mechanism that can detect any sort of network or security anomalies. Uh, via content inspection. Now, some of them have tried to use flow logs. Um, they've had some success. The challenge with flow logs, though, is you're already getting metadata information. You're not actually getting the raw packets, and you're not getting the IP headers, and you need that for a lot of the anomaly detection, uh, certainly on the security side. And then very often, an attack is not a single packet or a single flow. It might be a number of different packets and flows, and so you want to actually be able to watch it for a period of time. A lot of customers want to be able to use third-party appliances within AWS. Um, and they want to be able to use these, you know, they use many of these on-premises today, and they want to use them in AWS, and so they want to be able to use those to do the anomaly detection. And th we actually have a number of customers that are looking for ways to just store this data. I, I run an anomaly detection now, um, but I want to make sure I store all of this network traffic or some variant of that, because maybe there's some issue at some point down the line, and I want to go back and rerun that to see if I was ever vulnerable um, to any of these, these issues that may have happened. And so in June of this year, we announced a feature called Amazon, TC uh, Amazon VPC Traffic Memory. Uh, and I brought it up here. Some of you may not have seen that, but we do have the ability now to mirror traffic from any of your EC2, any of your Nitro-enabled EC2 instances to an ENI, either within your local v VPC or another VPC that you want to be mirroring to. 
A couple of customers have sold this in the past running agents on the instances. Uh, obviously, that's uh, not great to manage, difficult to manage those agents. The other thing is it's not really a secure environment. And you could have somebody on the instance tamper with the agent and actually be able to mask any sort of traffic that went through that box. And so with um, traffic mirroring, we actually do that deep within um, the networking stack. It's even way below the hypervisor. It's literally within the card. Um, and so there's absolutely no way that anybody on the instance has any access to any of that, uh, the way that the traffic is mirrored. Um, and we have increased monitoring options. So what we did is we said, well, we're going to mirror this traffic to an ENI. Um, and we have a number of partners. It was a great launch. We actually had 19 partners at launch. We launched it at, at uh, the New York Summit. Um, and these are all partners, folks like ExtraHop, uh, Jask, Riverbed, uh, Symantec, Colite. I'm not going to name all 19. They've all been great. Um, if you have these appliances in the AWS marketplace, and they put them, in, they want to be able to run them in your VPC. And what you can do with traffic mirroring is redirect your traffic to this appliance, um, and it'll do all of the analysis um, to, to you know, identify any sort of traffic issues, identify you know, any, any sort of things you may want to know about in your traffic. And so um, just a little bit about how it works, very basically. And so in this case, I've got a VPC. Um, I've got an internet gateway on that VPC as well, an EC2 instance, and then an ENI. Uh, attached to that EC2 instance. And so traffic's coming in, it's flowing through my internet gateway, it's hitting my network, everything's fine, I'm not using traffic mirroring. Um, I go via the API and I can actually, in, well, I, firstly I create another VPC, sorry. Create another VPC uh, and there I put a single instance that I want to use to actually collect this data. I then enable traffic mirroring. I go in and say on this instance, please mirror my traffic and mirror that traffic through to the ENI attached to that instance. And so the traffic will immediately start mirroring through um, to that instance. Now, there are some cases, if you think about it, you, you may, if you're mirroring a lot of instances, you might exceed um, sort of the 100 gigs that you could take on, on a single instance, or maybe the 25 if you're running a C5 or one of those instance types. So uh, the next example shows sort of a larger scale version where it's coming in via the Internet Gateway once again. You've now got three uh, instances there. And what you've done in the second VPC is we've actually put an appliance behind a network load balancer. So you can actually put a network load balancer there um, and then ENIs on those appliances. And now what we can do is we can actually load balance when I turn on tra traffic mirroring, I can load balance across uh, all of those appliances. And so I'm able to scale them out horizontally. And so that's traffic mirroring, uh, launched in June of this year. Uh, certainly a feature that was very much in demand in the enterprise space. Um, and so good to have it out there. Traffic mirroring provides you with passive monitoring, um, which means you kind of know that something happened after the event, right? It happened. You didn't block it before it happened. And so we have some customers that are looking to do um, active monitoring, which is monitoring where I'm actually in line with the traffic, and I want to be able to block that traffic when it happens. And so, so we've heard from customers, we need a firewall for all traffic between on-premises and AWS. Uh, we have compliance requirements for intrusion detection in a VPC. Our security organization requires application-level inspection. We would like to centralize security appliances for any internet traffic. Any of you ever said any of those? Definitely? OK, good. Somebody had two hands over there. And so. Uh, you know, what the great thing is, we've actually got a lot of appliances today in the AWS marketplace. Uh, you know, and fantastic to have our partners in there um, with these appliances, and you see our number of names there. Uh, I just picked a few. But one of the challenges is, how do I take that appliance and actually put it in the right place in my VPC and route traffic to it? Right? So I want traffic coming from the internet to hit that appliance regardless of the destination IP. The destination IP might actually be targeting another instance in the VPC, but I want to make sure that it always goes through that firewall. Um, today, you tr some customers do it with NAT, they do source NAT, all sorts of crazy implementations. Uh, it's a pain to manage. Um, and it can also slow that NAT the, slow the firewall down at some point once your NAT table gets really, really large. And so um, we kind of thought about it and said, was this something we could do? And so yesterday, I was happy to announce uh, Amazon VPC ingress routing. And so this redirects ingress traffic to third-party appliances before it reaches your, the target destination. And so we talked to it. So ingress routing makes it dead easy um, to deploy network appliances within your VPC and get the traffic to where you want it to be. And so basically what you have to do is launch a VP, launch a uh, instance from the marketplace, go in and choose your appliance. Um, you can now attach a route table to an internet gateway or a VGW, and you can set up that route table however you'd like it. And so basically you could indicate that any traffic destined for a subnet or an instance should be forwarded to the security appliance at which point it gets monitored and then put back on the wire and, and redirects through to the, the backend instance. And so ease of deployment, very, very easy. Fine-grained policies, you can control those routes at very fine-grained fine level of granularity and control exactly where that traffic would be. You could have multiple different appliances to different <laughs> subnets. You, from a compliance point of view, you can use the same appliance now um, within your VPC as you would use on-prem. 
Um, and then obviously we have a number of partners um, that have launched with us. And so just very basic kind of to explain that again. So I have an internet gateway. You can see I've now attached a route table to the IGW, which I wasn't able to do before um, this launch. I can also do it with a VGW, so traffic coming over Direct Connect or VPN. Um, and that traffic is now hitting the firewall and then moving off um, to that instance after the fact. So exciting to put that out there. Um, we had a number of different partners launch with us. Um, the ones on the slide um, with Traffic Marine. And so there were many of them did blog posts yesterday and press releases yesterday with this launch. Um, and so if you use any of those, please go and use them with Traffic Marine. Um, it, it, it's really, really great. So uh, now we have Traffic Marine, Ingress Routing. Uh, they're really separate features. And but we had one a customer that kind of did something really interesting with them. And so what they did was created a VPC, um, had a firewall in there, number of machines, um, they had a user, and they were sending traffic through that firewall and into that VPC. And what they wanted to do is they said, if I ever detect anything in that firewall, if any sort of issue happens, um, I would like to go and execute a Lambda function. And what that Lambda function will do is it'll actually go and enable uh, traffic memory and capture packets for a period of time. Maybe we capture 10 minutes of traffic or whatever. Um, and then maybe turn it off again. And so it's a way where you can sort of you know, automate the turn on of traffic mirroring when you detect some sort of issue within the system. And so we thought that was pretty clever. So let's dive into the next section, building global networks. Uh, I'm super excited to be talking about this today. Uh, I'm very glad, you know, last year at reInvent, the big theme for us was fixing, solving the connectivity problem between VPCs. Uh, some of you may have heard me say when we built VPC back in 2009, we thought everybody would create one VPC. We literally had a limit, it was one. Who would ever need another one? Turns out, all of you guys create tens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands. We even have some customers with hundreds of thousands of VPCs. And they've been a great building block, right? Very a great way of isolating your application. Um, I think you've made the absolutely right decision to use many, many of them. Uh, but we had to deal with the connectivity challenges. And so last year at reInvent, um, we launched a service called Transit Gateway. Um, which I believe has largely solved that problem. Um, I don't have many customers talking to me about connectivity challenges anymore, and when I do, they normally haven't tried Transit Gateway. Um, and so we're super excited about this product. It allows you basically to create a single Transit Gateway, which is outside of a VPC, and bring in a number of VPCs, so you can attach thousands of VPCs to a Transit Gateway. You notice I said thousands, we made sure it's, you're not gonna run into limits there, and we, that's a soft limit, we can go higher. Um, you can also bring in VPN, and you can bring in Direct Connect Gateway. Um, and so any of that traffic, so whether it's coming in from that VPN, uh, where it's coming in from Direct Connect or any of those VPCs, it can speak to any endpoint. It's not like you, like you had with peering where you had to have the full mesh. You just create one gateway, you attach everything. And so it's been great to see this go, go out there. Um, and as I said earlier, and well, I didn't say it earlier, but it's in my notes, so I should have said it earlier. Uh, Transit Gateway is actually a cloud router. Um, and so that's the way to think about it. Um, and we started thinking, well, are there other things we could do with a cloud router. Obviously, we're solving this problem of connectivity, um, but are there other sorts of things we could maybe look at supporting? And one of the ones that came up was this idea of multicast routing. Uh, multicast routing uh, quickly distributes copies of the same data from a single source uh, to, to multiple subscribers. So subscribers subscribe to a source, and that data, that traffic gets replicated out of all of those locations. Um, often used in sort of media distribution, uh, video conferencing, teleconferencing, that sort of space where you want to send multiple media streams out to, to different locations, sorry, single media stream out to different locations. Um, also very, very popular in sort of the stock exchange space where they're sending out quotes or trades um, out to multiple subscribers. And what they really want there is to get it out to the subscribers and kind of all arrive at the same time as well. Um, and so there's, there's really been no easy way of doing this. Um, some customers have obviously run agents, but we haven't really had multicast um, functionality. And, and normally, you have to go and buy hardware to do this. And so you'd have to buy hardware, and if you need to scale, you'd have to buy more hardware. And that hardware, you obviously can't run inside AWS. You'd have to run that on-prem and keep your data center. There's just a number of challenges. And so um, I'm happy to announce the availability of AWS Transit Gateway Multicast, um, which makes it simple to build and deploy multicast applications on AWS. And so it's completely cloud-native. Um, you literally use a set of APIs on Transit Gateway um, you create a multicast group, you can attach subscribers to that group, um, and you can generate traffic from a source, and that'll be or multicasted out um, to those um, subscribers. Um, from a scaling point of view, uh, it's obviously the cloud, so it's no longer based on hardware. You can scale up and down as you need it, you can change that, um, and it's also all controlled by the API. And so typically with multicast, you don't have much control over the authentication of receivers or subscribers, 
um, with AWS, both security groups and the APIs and the authentication that's involved there, you can really control and lock down who's able to subscribe to your multicast feeds. And so we actually think we, we're taking that a step further. And so, also happy to announce, Transfer Gateway VPC Interregion Peering. Uh, you know, many customers, while they've been building scalable uh, transit gateways within a single region, the requirement has been, well, if I'm using multiple regions, why couldn't I use a transit gateway and peer between those regions? And so we have that available um, today. And so it's uh, very similar to what we have with VPC peering, uh, inter-region VPC peering, except this is between the transit gateways, which has, um, we'll talk about it now, but a very critical difference. Um, but still private on the AWS backbone, highly available, no single point of failure. Um, you know, you're using a massively distributed networking system that we've developed to do that, so it's not uh, relying on any single source of boxes that customers typically run, like VPN appliances and that sort of thing. And obviously, all the traffic is encrypted and anonymized. By anonymized, we mean all the traffic gets put into a single pipe. There's no way that I can identify any traffic from any customer um, when it flows between regions. And so we take a look at what that looks like, and so it's a similar diagram to what I had with Transit Gateway, but uh, you know, now I've got, on the left-hand side, Amazon VPC, and I've got a VPN connection, two VPCs there. Um, and that's region one. On the other side, I have region two, um, which has uh, Amazon VPCs again um, and AWS Direct Connect. And so one of the great things about this is I can have that VPC over in region one talk to any instance in any of those attached VPCs over in region two. I can have an instance in VPC on the region one talk to an instance located in the on-prem location on the other side of Direct Connect in region two. I could have a server on the other side of the VPN talk to a server in the other side of Direct Connect in region two. And literally, I'm not even terminating either of those connections in AWS. I'm just using the AWS backbone um, to, to, get, to communicate that traffic globally. And so uh, very, very excited um, about where this is going. Um, one of the other things we've been thinking about is um, Obviously, connectivity between regions solves a massive problem. Um, but customers actually need um, the very best network connectivity to AWS from locations that are outside of AWS, not, not actually in an AWS location. Um, many of them have branch offices in smaller cities. They've built applications that are running in the cloud. Um, and they want to make sure that those users in those branch offices don't have an impaired connection or bad experience in using those applications that are now hosted on AWS. Um, they may, even, it may even be a company that has offices based on multiple continents, for example. And you want to make sure that you know, you've hosted in a single region or maybe two regions globally. You want to make sure that everybody gets a great experience um, talking to those applications. Now, one of the challenges with this, uh, what customers typically do is you can obviously get Direct Connect. Um, you know, not everybody puts Direct Connect in every one of their branch offices. Um, typically, they're normally data centers and some offices. And so the smaller ones, what do you do? Well, you go with VPN. And so you connect those offices up to the nearest AWS region. And the challenge with that is that VPN connection, until it reaches the region, is actually traveling on the internet. And so you have a similar problem to what we were talking about with the backbone, where any provider along the way um, you know, could actually run into problems. They, they could have a, an issue. Um, they could be overloaded. They could be dropping packets. They could go down. And that's going to impact the quality of that, that VPN connection. And that's one of the challenges you know, with VPN today. And so. Um, we started thinking about, well, is there something that we could do to make that better? Is there something that we could do to reduce the likelihood that you're going to see impact on VPN, improve the latency, and make it more secure? And it turns out uh, there was something we could do. And so happy to announce AWS Accelerated Site-to-Site -site VPN. And so more secure, predictable, and performant VPN experience from your branch office locations to services hosted within AWS. And so this builds on the, the current version of Site-to-Site -site VPN that we have. But instead of your connection reaching out to a region, it will now, via Global Accelerator, reach out to the closest edge location to where your office might be. If you remember, we had 210 edge locations globally. And so you can now make use of those to terminate your VPN connection. So you, really, you probably have, in many cases in the US, an edge location in a city, either multiple in most of the larger cities right near you. Uh, it might be one within the same state or very close. And so you really just travel on your local ISP until you get to our edge location. And once that's done, you're running on the Amazon backbone um, all the way to AWS. And so this uh, changes the performance significantly. Um, you know, within the US, you can see some improvement in performance. If you start looking internationally, we've seen up to 30% reduction in, in, in jitter and latencies 
um, using this um, versus the standard site-to-site -to, -site to VPN connection. Um, and so that's what it would look like now. So instead of those branch offices connecting into the regions, you go and set up your VPN. When you create the VPN, you indicate you'd like to use um, v accelerated VPN, there's a little checkbox, and you'll now actually make use of that backbone and connect in via the nearest edge location. Um, and so excited to do that. Uh, so we looked at inter-region peering. Uh, we've, now we've looked at connectivity from your location to AWS and how we've improved that by utilizing the backbone in another way. Um, and well, there's something else that customers need to do as well. Um, many customers uh, need to communicate between their branches. It's not just about connectivity from the branch to AWS. Um, historically, what customers would do in this case is they would run appliance routers. They'd have routers uh, in, in, in their branches, um, and they would start managing these routers and bring up a new branch and manage another router. Um, and over, the time, over time, that can become quite tedious, managing all these routers. And so um, a similar thing happened to what happened to software-defined networking, where they separated out the data plane of the network um, from the control plane. And uh, that's what SD-WAN basically is, where you've got your routers running in your data center, but you've got a control plane that's sort of observing that traffic and making routing decisions. And we've got a lot of smarts built into it um, to control traffic between the regions. And so we started to think, was, was there something we could do um, to integrate better um, with SD-WAN uh, providers um, to really uh, make sure that you, know, you, you don't have a situation where you have your branch locations and then you have AWS and they feel like two separate networks and neither side have any visibility into the other one, and you're stuck having to manage both of those. And so very, very excited to announce SD-WAN integration um, with the following SD-WAN partners. Um, so Cisco, Silverpeak, Aruba, and Aviatrix. Um, we, we do have a number of other partners that will be launching with us shortly. Um, these ones have been great to work with. Uh, we've been working with them for several months. We approached them with the idea several months ago, um, and it's been a lot of iterating um, to get to where we are today. And so it's been... It's been a really good journey. And so these four SD-WAN partners, um, their SD-WAN solutions can now easily integrate um, their branch locations with customers TGW and AWS. Um, and you can, use, like, you can utilize the accelerated VPN as well. Um, and so you can get that better connectivity, but with much deeper and better integration um, with those SD-WAN appliances. And the actual API, the APIs that are controlling those appliances are actually calling um, Transit Gateway to actually configure them. And so we spoke inter-region peering, how do we improve the connectivity to your, to your region via our edge locations? What are we doing for connectivity uh, from you know, the branch locations um, with SD-WAN? Uh, and so we thought well, we've got to kind of close out the story. And so how can we make it simple and scalable to build a global network uh, within a region uh, and manage that global network uh, in a single pane? Uh, the AWS console can get rather complicated at times when you're managing many, many uh, you know, different devices, um, managing connections, configuration, route tables. Um, the health of all those uh, devices is, comes out by a CloudWatch. Um, so we have health for most of our VPNs, direct connects, um, but it's in CloudWatch, you gotta go and find it. And so we thought there might be a way for us to actually give you a single pane of glass um, that you're able to configure and view and monitor your entire global network starting with Transit Gateway and all the way out to the branches with SD-WAN. And so we're happy to announce AWS Transit Gateway Network Manager. And this is a new console to visualize and monitor network connectivity across AWS and on-premise networks. And so you can manage and monitor. Uh, essentially, you go in, uh, open up Network Manager, you create a new global network. You can have as many global networks as you'd like. Um, you associate a Transit Gateway or multiple Transit Gateways with a global network. Um, once we know what transit gateways you want to associate, we will automatically go and mine that information for those transit gateways. And so we'll pull out any VPCs that are attached, any VPNs that are attached, any direct connects that are attached, um, as well as any SD-WAN devices that have been registered and attached as well. Um, and so that gives you visibility, and it also gives you monitoring. And so you're able to see if any of those devices are reporting an event that indicates that it's down, has it recovered, you can go mine, you can look at that. Um, the other thing we built into it is we built in an eventing system. And we said, wouldn't it be cool if you have a VPN connection that goes down that I could actually go and trigger a Lambda function to do something? Or if I go and attach a VPN, uh, sorry, a VPC or a VPN to a transit gateway, wouldn't it be cool if I could trigger a Lambda function to go and do a routing configuration in another region? 
and just give you that ability to kind of program the network and react to events. And so that's available in, in uh, Transit Gateway Network Manager as well. And so I want to show you a few screenshots. Uh, this is kind of the global view. Uh, everything comes in with geolocation information. Uh, the SD-WAN providers provide us with that as well. And so we're actually able to plot your network. And there you can see uh, you know, the various different, the transit gateways are shown in orange. You've got your VPNs in green. Uh, your impaired VPN is shown in yellow. And your VPN that's considered to be completely down. Um, that's where both tunnels are down versus one tunnel being down um, are shown in red. Um, and so you can literally get this global view. You can zoom in. You can click on those buttons. You can bring up you know, what, what devices are attached to that TGW. You can click through to monitoring. Uh, you also have another view. This is sort of showing you um, some of the VPNs that are attached. And so now I've zoomed in and actually clicked on that transit gateway. And I can there see the VPN appliances. I can click through to the uh, configuration console if I want to do that as well. Um, we have another view as well, which is uh, sort of your network view, um, your flowchart view. And so this is a great one for actually mining the health um, of network appliances. And so you can see here at the top of that graph, um, on the top of that slide, you've actually got the top VPN that is, that is red, and that will be visible as you collapse that. You can see it'll go yellow, and you'll know that there's some problem over there, and you need to go and take a look. And then finally, there's full health monitoring built into it with dashboards as well. And so now you have one place to go for all of your um, devices to actually see um, you know, what that monitoring is instead of scratching around in, in cloud, uh, cloud watching to see um, what's going on. And so we're uh, very, very excited um, about all of those features um, from interregion peering to improving your connectivity via VPN to AWS, to integration with the SD-WAN partners, and then building a dashboard um, that allows you to see all of that as one network and start managing this end-to-end. Um, -end. And so I'm also very, very excited today to welcome Sachin Gupta uh, from Cisco on stage. And Sachin is the Senior Vice President of Enterprise Products, so please join me in welcoming him on stage. Okay. Hey, Sachin. Thanks for coming. It's great to have you today. Yeah, today. Um, and so maybe start off by just telling us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I'm a senior vice president at Cisco. I focus on enterprise product. I'm part of the intent-based networking group. That group is responsible for all of our networking products from users and devices all the way to applications and data. So what that means is your campus, your branch WAN, data center, and now cloud networking are all part of that organization. Fantastic, excellent. And so, so such as yesterday, we officially announced, two days ago, we officially announced the partnership between Cisco and AWS. Um, but we've been working together for a long time and collaborating. Um, tell us a little bit about some of the, the wins we've had over the years. Yeah, look, this is a, this is a really, really a big deal because Cisco, as the, network, the number one networking player, security player in the market, and with AWS as the number one cloud provider, we really need to come together early. And for the last few years, we've already brought tremendous innovation to the market. So first, the top selling router, the cloud router you described in AWS marketplaces from Cisco, and we continue to work together and add innovation there, as well as the top security products in marketplace um, are, are from Cisco. In addition, uh, ACI, which is our application-centric infrastructure, uh, think of that as a way to automate, orchestrate, drive policy for an on-prem data center, now is supported anywhere. And the first cloud uh, provider that we worked with on that was AWS again. That's so great. Just how you manage an on-prem data center and policy, yeah. you can do that in AWS. That's fantastic. That's awesome. And so we announced a number of features. Yeah. Uh, and we've been working closely on a number of them. Uh, let's start off with SD-WAN. Tell us a little bit about what SD-WAN means. In yeah, you, look, you already laid the groundwork a little bit on you know, why SD-WAN is important. It's a data plane yeah. control plane separation. Let me just add to that a little bit. Uh, look, cloud has fundamentally changed how customers think about networking, right? It's not branch and sites to private data centers. Now I might have co-location, carrier neutral facilities. Uh, I have, you know, you talked about thousands of VPCs, inter-region. I need to think about connectivity, application services and security in a fundamental different way. Now, SD-WAN is here and now. We have over 20,000 customers deploying Cisco SD-WAN today. In fact, 70 of the Fortune 100 already use Cisco SD-WAN. Yeah. And the reason they do that is because it's not a one-size-fits-all. Depending on the application need and the cloud networking need, how you deploy, how you design is going to vary significantly. So we've built an architecture with SD-WAN that allows us to provide the scale, cloud scale, and provide the security. And, and what's new here uh, with SD-WAN that we announced that we're very excited about is, look, you've got this great new capability with uh, Transit Gateway, and customers are asking us, hey, I want to take my SD-WAN fabric that 
allows me to select multiple ISPs, go over 5G, go over you know, satellite or whatever the links are. And in addition, I want to extend that fabric all the way into the AWS cloud. So remember that control plane can now decide what traffic, how do I steer traffic to the right place to get the best application experience? Now, at the same time, single pane of glass. How do I use the Cisco SD-WAN solution with vManage and orchestrate not just between my sites and my colos, but also orchestrate kinds of gateway functionality so I can do the north-south stitching as well as the SD-WAN fabric stitching all in one. Yeah, so we have that visibility now from both sides. Exactly, you have is, it on both sides. Which is great for the customer. Um, and so that, that's SD-WAN. I know yeah. our teams have been working really hard on that, and thanks for the work there. We've also been working on ingress routing together, so yeah. tell us a little bit of what you've done there. Yeah, so ingress routing, again, a fantastic new capability that we can leverage, and it goes back to giving IP that consistency on-prem and in the cloud. So first of all, on-prem, you would have the connectivity, but then you would have the services stack, layer four to seven services, firewalls, you would have the monitoring capability to detect threats. Now, our customers, mutual customers, are asking for the same capability in AWS. Yeah. And so what ingress routing allows us to do is be very selective about which workload, which application traffic needs to hit which L4 to 7 services, load balancers, security firewalls, et cetera, and orchestrate that service chain in an automated way using Cisco tooling. So once you've got that connectivity fabric set up, the next thing you want to do is make sure that the security rules, the firewall rules, are done the same way. So our Cisco Defense Orchestrator will allow you to do that on-prem, and you mentioned this, and for that firewall appliance, virtual appliance, in the cloud. And then last but not least, you want to be able to detect threats. So StealthWatch was up there, right? So StealthWatch now works with cloud hmm. so that you can detect threats that might be happening in your cloud environment the same way you can do on-prem. So same tools, IT consistency delivered for layer four to seven services as well. That's, that's great. And I'm just about to get into the output section of my talk. Yeah. But I know we've been doing some work there as well. And so tell me a little bit about Yeah, output is kind of interesting, right? Yeah. It kind of, it, it turns it upside down because now you're taking the best of AWS cloud capability yeah. and bringing that in an on-prem instance. Yes. Okay, well now what do you want to do? You need to be able to take the policy work that we provide uh, with application-centric infrastructure where I can orchestrate a private data center for application policy. I can orchestrate within AWS Cloud. Yeah. And now with Outposts, we've just completed testing with you, uh, where you can use ACI, again, to, up, to implement application policy with the same platform That's great. consistent for IT. And so it's integrating really well with the customer that already runs all of the Cisco. Yeah, and we have thousands and thousands of customers already using ACI, yeah. and they can now get to extend that capability with Outposts. That's excellent. Super exciting. Well, it's yeah. been fantastic working with yourself and your team. We're not done yet, right? Like we're, we're, we're absolutely we're continue not collaborating. Done yet. We, we have a lot of stuff. Intensely focus on our customers and absolutely. keep innovating. Absolutely. It's been good. It's been great. Thanks, Thanks very much. Dave. Thanks, Sachin, for joining me. So one last section. I'll be about bringing the cloud closer to you. And uh, one of the things we're seeing, um, you know, we've been telling customers about Outposts is, Outposts is obviously an, an AWS rack um, that you can put into your own data center. And we've been telling a lot of customers, really, there's two reasons you do it. One is latency, and the other one is if you have any sort of local data. Um, but in thinking about this, um, one of the things that I'm starting to observe is, you know, in the last 10 years, we've observed an incredible change in sort of the application framework, right? The app, if you think about how much the apps on your phone have changed in the last 10 years, what 4G has done. And the, at the same time, uh, the hardware has improved so significantly. If you look at what's happened to the processes in that time, Moore's Law died about four years ago, right? We can't keep up with Moore's Law anymore. Um, and so we've got this, this innovation in CPUs, innovation in storage with NVMe drives, with innovation in uh, memory, you know, speeds of memory. And so what's starting to happen, it's interesting, is, is network latency uh, is starting to become a bottleneck. And the, the next wave of applications, and we don't know what many of them are going to be, but certainly starting to see a lot of applications now um, that are starting to have very, very, very low latency requirements. The good news is all we have to do is solve the speed of light. Um, and we're still working on that. Um, but that is the fundamental problem, right? We can optimize our routers as much as we want, but it takes a piece of light a certain amount of time to travel through a piece of optical fiber. Um, and so the only th option we really have is to make sure we can bring that capacity and that AWS service and that compute um, closer to your environment and sort of attack the speed of light from that point of view. And so that's what AWS Outposts is all about, where you have workloads that have very, very low latency requirements, 
um, or maybe you have local data on site. Um, AWS Outposts can go into your environment, and it's something that you're able to order. It's an AWS designed physical rack. It is the same rack that we put into our own data centers. Um, it, it's fully managed. We thought about doing some sort of rack in a data center many, many years ago. I know others did it, and people wondered why we didn't do it. The reason we didn't do it is we said, well, if I put a rack in your data center and make you do the software updates, that's not cloud. And we were the cloud provider. We want to stay the cloud provider. And so with Outposts, it's completely fully managed remotely. So when we do a deployment, if we launch a new feature, you will have it on your Outposts the day we announce it, assuming it's a software feature, not a hardware feature. Um, when, when a machine fails, we'll automatically monitor and detect that, tell you it's failed, move workloads, and then send a replacement in the mail um, with this company called Amazon that delivers packages, your Amazon box that arrives. Uh, and it's, it's also the exact same experience as AWS because you're using the APIs, the standard APIs, the standard console. You just go in and decide, I'd like to launch this into a subnet that's associated with my outpost. And so super excited about where that's going. So that's the one way that we're combating the problem of latency. The other thing, though, is some customers say, well, I don't really want my own outpost. It's very exciting to have AWS hardware in my data center, but I'm, I don't really need that. Um, and what I would like is an availability zone that's closer to me. I want one that's just less than 10 milliseconds away from where my workload is. And so yesterday we announced introducing AWS local zones. AWS local zones is run latency center of applications at the edge using AWS infrastructure and services. And so think about a local zone as a very small availability zone, maybe as slightly fewer services in some of our larger zones. It is tied back to a region and so from that zone to the region, you'll see higher latencies. But within that zone, and from internet around that zone, you can get to that zone with very, very low latencies. And so again, availability zone fully managed by us and providing you with low latencies. But the first one is launched in Los Angeles. And so that's available now. You can go into the console today and actually sign up and request access um, to the first uh, local zone uh, launched in, in, in Los Angeles. And the reason we put it there is there's a lot of movie companies, media companies, film companies uh, in Los Angeles. And their requirement for low latency has grown significantly um, because what they're doing is they're shooting uh, literally movies, they're shooting uh, series such as this one. Um, that information is coming straight off a camera, it's going onto a snowball, and it's being transferred to AWS. And then they're using things like our G4 instance types, which are our very latest GPUs, targeted graphics and inference workloads and they're actually doing the colorization and the editing and the animation and everything, running Windows Adobe products on that G4 machine in the cloud. And obviously, if you're doing that sort of thing, you want to make sure that the latency is incredibly low. And so that was one of the initial targets of going to Los Angeles, is to provide a far zone there that's connected back to our Portland data center that's giving you that low latency. And we've been working with Netflix. It's been a lot of fun to work with them. Um, and they're actually doing this where they, they're producing content and then uploading that content and having it available uh, in that far, in that, sorry, the, the internal name was far zones, I keep calling it far zones. But then we decided, well, that's not customer centric, we should call it local zone, so it's not local zones. Um, and so Netflix said they're excited to announce uh, AWS local zone in Los Angeles, which brings cloud resources close to creators and filmmakers and cuts down on latency between the artists and their workstations. And so expect to see us, I'm not 100% sure where all of them are gonna be, but this is something we expect to roll out into other locations. So many, many other places around the world, in the US, I think about you know, New York, East Coast, I'm not saying we're gonna do any of those, um, all around the world, um, but you're gonna see an increasing number of these uh, local zones over time. And so obviously if you want a local zone in your backyard, um, please talk to your account manager, and we'll do what we can to make it happen. And then uh, you know, finally, the next thing I think is really gonna drive latency and really bring the next big shift. And I don't think we fully understand, well, I certainly don't understand kind of what that's gonna look like or what the ramifications are gonna be, um, is 5G. Um, and so with 5G, uh, it's a very different protocol to what you're getting from 4G. Um, you've, uh, you, the big, a couple of big differences, a number of differences, a couple of big ones are very, very low latency. On 4G, you get about 35 to 40 milliseconds of latency, if you test that, regardless of how close you are to the cell tower. Um, with 5G, that's going all the way down to single digits. Um, and then throughput is, is substantially higher, right? Not the um, sort of latency we get on 4G, but in the order of you know, many gigabits. Um, and so 
yesterday we also announced AWS Wavelength. And AWS Wavelength is taking AWS infrastructure, you can think of this as a local zone, that's actually installed at the telco provider. And so we're essentially installing a local zone um, at Verizon, uh, installing a local zone at Vodafone, installing a local zone at KDDI and SK Telecom. And there'll be a number of other providers that we'll do over time as well. And so as you think about building applications for 5G um, and what that means, you'll be able to build those applications on AWS, and you'll be able to use a set of tools that will allow you to deploy those in a, in a provider agnostic way. So you'd be able to say, I'd like to make sure that this application has very low latency for 5G in these locations, the western half of the US, the whole US, the city, and you'll be able to target those launches. And wherever we have those um, essential local zones within the provider networks, um, be able to launch that capacity. Now, we've embedded it pretty deep within the network. It's actually at the city aggregation center. And so, so they have all the cell towers and they're all feeding traffic back to the aggregation center. And we're right there um, because going any further away or any further down the line adds latency. And what we're trying to do is reduce that latency. And so a lot of super interesting workloads from everything from uh, you know, robotics, we are gonna have 5G built in, getting rid of Wi-Fi in factories and starting to use 5G in those places. Um, gaming, uh, you think about you know, anybody playing games on their phone, regardless of what game it is, there's gonna be a lot, of, lot more game streaming with that sort of bandwidth and that low latency. Um, so if you use the Amazon service, you'd be able to beat your friend because you have better latencies and better. Uh, and then uh, you know, also um, things like uh, autonomous vehicles, um, self-driving cars that need very low latencies back to the cloud um, to communicate data. Hopefully they make all the decisions about stopping locally and don't, don't use the cloud for that. Um, but just an enormous number of workloads. Um, you know, also, uh, video cameras with 5G enabled so that we don't have to take um, trucks that do all the adverts and the stream management to a football field, but it's all just 5G cameras and the rest all just happens um, in the cloud. And so I think it's gonna change things in the ways we, we, we can think about right now, but it's gonna be interesting to see where it goes. And so with that, we've spoken about a number of things. It's been great to recap some of the features we launched this year. And then we, we spoke about VPC ingress routing, uh, be able to take an appliance and put that directly into your VPC and route traffic to it seamlessly. Um, accelerated site-to-site -site VPN, giving you the Amazon backbone very close to where you are for your VPN connections. Transit Gateway Network Manager, that overview of all your networks you can manage, uh, and we're gonna be iterating on that and bringing more and more objects and components to that over time. And then Transit Gateway Interregion Peering, ability to peer Transit Gateways between regions and really create these truly global networks. Um, and then finally, uh, Transit Gateway Multicast. I've been pleasantly surprised how many people are excited about Multicast. I was a little worried, it was a very niche, but it seems like many people are excited about that feature. And so, uh, very excited to see you guys go and use that. And so, with that, a uh, number of other talks, you may wanna consider either attending a rerun, if some of these have happened already, or maybe watching them on YouTube afterwards. They're gonna give you more details about all the stuff that I've spoken about at a much more uh, technical level. And with that, thank you very much. It's been fantastic to talk to you all. I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of reInvent.